All right. It really is the top of the hour, and we should begin. Let me welcome everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm so glad to see so many of you here today to talk about a really amazing subject. And we have a truly exceptional, exceptional guest that I'm just delighted to connect you all with. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm the forum's creator. I'm the host. I'm the cat herder. And I'll be your guide to the next hour of conversation about the future of education. Now, all of that feeds into what we're doing for the next few months. So we're going to have sessions on academic women of color, on work-life balance, on how to do webinars well, like today, on HyFlex. We'll have the HyFlex inventor with us to catch up on where we are with that, on how to redesign liberal education, and what accrediting agencies are doing to shape the future of education. So if you want to find out more about those sessions, if you want to sign up for them, just go to tinyurl.com slash forumfall2020. Now, all that is to say we want to welcome this week's guest. Um, I'm especially honored to welcome Nancy White because she's someone whose career I followed for years and years, whose work I've been inspired by. Uh, every time I connect with her, I learn something more about how to facilitate, how to guide, how to host, how to convene. Truly, she is a global expert in this with clients from all over the world, multiple continents. Uh, she is someone who is also just devilishly creative, always energetic, and just an absolute, I find, gift to how we think and understand how we work together in groups. She is really, really uh, a guru on how to do this with video and live video events, which is why I'm inviting her to talk today. Now, we have, of course, so many reasons for this. So many of us spend a lot of time on video conferencing tools like Shindig or Zoom or Teams or others. Um, but I think we should really take a moment and dive into what makes them work well. How can we have webinars that are awesome? How can we have video events that are truly memorable? Okay, are you back? <laughs> yeah, I think the, the internet universe had a little burp. That's okay, that's okay. Welcome, I'm so glad you could come today. Thank you for having me, what, what a fun thing. I'm just sitting here like noticing people that I've known from other iterations over the years and it's just fabulous. I keep on scrolling through going, oh, they're so, so, I'm just, I'm a little giddy. That's but now I'm time. drinking decaf tea, so we're okay. Oh my gosh, decaf. Oh no, 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 no. That's Almost. horrifying. That's horrifying. Um, Nancy, I, I, I've introduced you uh, in the role that I perceive you in. And in our emails to everybody and our social media uh, campaign, I've mentioned that you were one of the founders and leading partners of Full Circle Associates. But to, to give people a better sense of who you are and what you do, can you tell us a bit about what you hope to be working on, what you hope to be thinking about for the next, say, six months or so. That gives a sense of what you do. Well, first, a disclaimer. I, I absolutely refuse the term guru. Um, and I absolutely prioritize the term learner. And that stance, a learner or practitioner, and that stance, I think, is essential to answer the question and to show up here today. Um, so the next six months, boy, well, it's informed by what happened in the last four months when everything changed, right? Um, I, I have a history of being a person who works online and offline. And all my old online clients, you know, I basically said goodbye to them 10 years ago. They all were fine doing their own thing. And then all of a sudden I get these phone calls. We have to move X offline into online and everything changed. Yes. And that became a moment of opportunity because whereas only I think the most advanced people were willing to actually create fully embodied, fully human online experiences. And everyone else was getting on their freaking airplanes and their privilege and flying places. Yeah. Um, which is ironic because a lot of my clients are working with climate change and I'm like, and you're getting on an airplane. Mm -hmm. yeah. Why? Okay. Um, yeah. So there was this, you know, rebirth of possibility. So the next six months are about nurturing possibility about taking this moment when people who would otherwise say, Oh no, you can't do that online. It has to be face to face. The only way we can have trust and relationship 
and do X, Y, Z as face to face. And I'm going, listen, if we stopped everything today, that is one option, but we all have to stop, not just some of us. Otherwise the disproportionality will just be even worse. So either we're all in folks, or we say, let's put a stop to the world. Let's put everything on pause for the next 12, 18, 24 months, and then we'll take up later. Okay. And education included. And I think this is really, for me, a very uh, um, nerve exposed topic because I have two small people who live with me, my grandchildren, and thinking about schooling and, and one of them who has an IEP and, and thinking about how this translates into the real lived experience is super important. So for me, the next six months are how do we incrementally and every single time we gather together synchronously or asynchronously improve what we're doing and improve the outcomes, which means we're paying attention to outcomes. OK, it means we're not just doing this, but we're saying, how are we how are we measuring ourselves? How are we evaluating ourselves so that we improve? That's the learner practitioner stance, which has to be particularly heightened right now. We can't say, well, that worked last week because the technology changed this week, or that worked last week because we have 20 times more people willing to experiment with us than we had last week. Okay. This is this, this, I don't know words. I need, I need good Italian arms. Um, <laughs> and, and so it, it is practicing. Um, and then it is balancing because I literally have more work than I can get done in a day. And I have two small children who the school district is expecting to park in front of a Microsoft Teams from 7.55 in the morning to 2.25 in the afternoon. I'm like, okay, none of this is realistic, okay? And I can sit and complain about it, or I can say, I will take your offering as a very loose offering, and I will riff and improvise upon it until we come up with something that A, works for my family, B, works for my clients, C, works for their uh, constituents. D begins to change the system. So literally, I'm looking for system change. I'm looking for in the next six months to radically transform how we gather together um, and that it could affect any domain, including education. How's that for minor? Well, you started off by saying you were a student, a learner, and now we want to transform how we gather together. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. That's just the kind of thing that I wanted to hear. And if you're new, again, those of you who uh, who don't know Nancy, this is this is how she rolls. Um, I'm so glad to see um, to hear you. And Lauren, I'm glad that your uh, audio is fine. Uh, Lauren, just refresh the screen uh, if uh, uh, if you want to try that again. We'll still be here. Um, if you're new to the forum, uh, we don't have an agenda. We don't have a prescribed set of questions. Uh, we proceed organically. Usually I kick things off with a couple of questions. Our guest goes wild with answers. And then all of you have questions and comments. So again, please, the um, raised hand button is there if you'd like to join us on stage. Uh, and the question box is there. And in fact, before I can even say this, before I can even finish saying it, we have a question already. So let me just flash this on the screen right now. And this is from Eric Green. He says, Nancy, what is your experience right now? Well, almost all the 120 participants of the shinding do not have cameras on. How does our choice change your interpersonal experience engaging with us? Oh, Where? Eric, this, this is a great question. And I think right now I'm experiencing this not necessarily as a stage, but as a fishbowl. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, mm -hmm. which can accommodate X or Y number of people in the middle and everyone else is in listen mode, okay? So the camera at this moment, if I if I imagine this, if I construct this as a fishbowl, is less important because I'm my intention when I'm in a fishbowl is paying attention to the few individuals I'm having a conversation with, which in this mm -hmm. case is Brian. I don't know which direction he is on your screen, but you know, mm -hmm. I'll pretend. So I'm looking at Brian's face. I'm looking at his nods or nods. If Brian were to turn his camera off, I would be very angry. <laughs> I would feel lost. I would feel that I'm losing cues that I need. That is a very different situation than if I'm sitting with a group of 20 students and we are saying we are in a learning community or a classroom um, together. They're not the same thing, but um, uh, you know, then with students with cameras off, we have a problem or we potentially have a problem. But the first thing is to understand what is the purpose of having the camera on and what are the reasons for the camera being off. I can't make assumptions about good or bad or useful or not unless those two questions are answered. And I think that goes to the heart of what the practice needs to be about is being clear on purpose 
and then getting the information or enough information, not all the information, we, don't, we really don't have the capacity to deal with all of the information, to make adjustments. So if I think that the purpose of our first engagement with my students online is to create relationships, I need to understand why they don't turn the camera on. Is it a technical issue? Is it a bandwidth issue? Is it a learning or cognitive, I'm, you know, this makes me very anxious when I turn my camera on issue? There can be a million reasons and in you know, and the idea of I want to engage them so that they feel invited in, not forced in. So maybe a camera's off for the first week for some people, and I might reach out to them individually and say, "Is there a reason your camera's off?" This goes back to the old school online stuff: is never assume you understand the problem in a virtual world. You need to ask. You need to go back and find out. So some of that is preparing ahead of time. Do all our students have functioning cameras? That's one question you can ask in advance. Do any of our students have cognitive issues where they need an on-ramp to getting comfortable with video? Are they in a situation where it's not safe to turn a video on because there's things happening behind them that are inappropriate? These are things we would never have probably even thought about, you know, seven months ago, right? Uh, why can't you turn your camera on? Because I have a chaotic world on, on behind me. Right now, I don't, but normally, actually, I do with a seven and a 10 year old in my life. So, um, you know, there's a lot of reasons. So I, I think the question is super relevant and it asks us to go to why do you need to do this? And then what do you need to know to change the dynamic? The, the follow up then is how do we get people into video comfort? And the, the simplest for me is starting in breakouts versus all, you know, start with one on one, put people in paired breakouts. Mm -hmm. um, ask them to discuss how it felt to have a video conversation. Use a question that may um, reflect different kinds of listening. So we have this mm -hmm. set of things in Liberating Structure called helping heuristics. What, and one is just attentive listening. So if Brian were talking, and Brian's doing it, he's not saying anything, he's nodding. Um, with the strange kind of way the windows are with Shindig, our eye-to-eye -eye contact is a little off. So we're both looking up to cameras and, you know, kind of trying to triangulate that. But, um, and then the, the, the second type of listening is to ask, tell me more. So Brian might start doing prompts. So what we do is we have people practice these five different kinds of listening, right? Which all will go all the way to provocative, you know. Well, I'm gonna play the devil's advocate with you. Um, and help them understand that we're using visual cues as part of that communication structure. Therefore, I'm giving a rationale of why I want cameras on, not just because I want to see your face. Come on, I want to see your face is not a sufficient reason. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm going to stop there. <laughs> yeah, the green screen is a good solution for privacy. Um, and, and I think we're getting better. I think, you know, the playful use of Zoom backgrounds can create a moment of connection. I mean, um, I can't show you my Zoom backgrounds now, but I have some weird ones that are used provocatively. I agree. I agree. Um, that's a that's a fantastic answer. That's a, that's a mini seminar by itself, right there. First, Eric, thank you, thank you for that great meta question. And of course, this is a meta session in many ways, friends. We've done meta sessions before on the forum, but if we're talking about webinars and video conferencing while we're doing it, that's perfect, Eric. Um, all kinds of responses have come back. Uh, my, uh, my colleague, John Stites uh, at uh, Georgetown uh, chimes in, my 25 years supporting higher ed tech give me license to preach on this. When doing web video, plug in. The lousiest wired network has more consistent bandwidth than the best wireless. Uh, quite true, quite true. And people don't even know what that means. So this is even more interesting. It's like, uh, what, am I, what am I plugging into? Yeah. So thinking about how we prepare or scaffold technology stuff and, and working with a lot of, I'm working with a bunch of floodplain engineers right now. And like, you know, online technology is not their domain. They are really smart people because it's like, huh? And some of them are on iPads and they're pushing buttons and some are on their phone and some are on the desktop. And that all compiles to make them feel very inadequate. Hmm. So, uh, you know, how we, how we scaffold the tech matters. And like, for me, it's like, if you're gonna use a new tool, play, have some sort of play with it before you mm -hmm. use it for the didactic or group yeah. process stuff. Um, so like we have people, when I'm using the annotation tool in Zoom, I, mm -hmm. I put up a coloring sheet before the session starts. So as people come on board, I tell them, okay, turn on the annotate. I screen share it, turn on the annotate, and they start coloring. And believe me, that really throws them off. And I'm like, why the heck? I 
you see having this color. But then when we go to use it as a stamping tool to understand whether there's convergence or divergence or thoughts or whatever, they immediately know how to use the tool. So we're in it. So there's the, you know, little uh, scaffolding tricks. And I think our toolbox for scaffolding tricks has to expand. Well, it's a fantastic scaffolding tool. The playfulness counts for an awful lot. Um, friends, I have a question I want to ask Nancy, but then I, I would love to hear from you. Um, so again, um, just uh, on the bottom bar of the, of the page, just press the raised hand button if you want to join us in the video. Um, Samantha and Barry, uh, I'm going to bring you up in a minute. Uh, if if you still want to be up, um, I'll, I'll beam you up. Uh, otherwise, just type in the um, question box, and uh, we'll be glad to display these questions and comments. Uh, so thank you for all of these. Um, my question to ask um, is, you know, thinking about this past, it's hard to tell how many months, right? I mean, plague time, pandemic time is kind of fluid. Um, what have you noticed about how people have changed in their behavior in online meetings? I mean, are we more used to this? Are we more formal? Are you noticing any any patterns of uh, change in this past in this year? Oh, oh God! And every week, every week the patterns have changed. I think um, one that showed up early was I was asked to come in and and do a quick ninety minutes with a bunch of community of practice people at the World Bank, and I. Mm -hmm. Have done work for the World Bank in the past, and dear World Bank people, if you're listening, please forgive me. But it's a pretty formal uh, environment where proving how smart you are is really important. You may notice this in higher education as well, right? I have to show you how smart I am. Um, and this was in the early days when everybody's kids were running in around, and people were in their sweatshirts. I mean, like I put on lipstick for you today, guys. This is really um, this is high high Thank art today. I my pretty shirt and my lipstick instead of my sweatshirt and, and not, but this created a leveling moment and a more willingness to engage in uncertainty and being able to work in areas that I don't have to prove myself as perfect. And that's a tremendous opportunity. And I'm afraid that is dissolving um, over time. I think the second trend is there's a sort of bifurcation, which is those who had bad offline meeting practices and they put their bad meetings online had horrible practices. And so the Zoom fatigue and the Zoom B, all this stuff was exacerbated by just replicating bad practices. Um, as I looked at my two granddaughters and how their teachers did things, I could see where, you know, there was some early on mistakes and when they learned from them and approved quickly, they kept the goodwill of the students, but where there's some practices that weren't really that generative, the turnoff rate was so fast, so fast and very worrisome because then you build the assumption that a, a, a really engaging um, learning experience is not possible. So for me, the first, the first experience is so important. Um, and even if you try something a little more daring with less certainty, I think your chances are greater than if you rely on, well, I think this traditional way is a better way to do it because I'm more certain of it. Well, in fact, online, I would be more certain it's not going to work. Um, <laughs> so, so the disruption here is the pattern. And creative destruction is like my byword of the last four months. We have to creatively destruct what was to create something new because we're not going back to the old times. The old times weren't that great, folks, okay? Yeah. There was great parts of it, but if we think of the practice as a whole, there was certainly more we can do. So I'm definitely one of the revolutionist sort of view. Um, iteratively revolutionize towards something new and don't um, try and replicate the comfort zone. So this asks a lot of people. So I think where the exhaustion comes in is constantly trying things, constantly experimenting, constantly putting yourself on the line, that takes a certain kind of energy. And when you succeed, you get more energy, but it still takes a lot of energy. So I, I think people are beginning to realize that we need to think about time differently. So as we go forward, time is a different element than it was before. Mm -hmm. I'll leave that one as a, as a cliffhanger for you. Well, that's a great answer. And of course, I want to pursue it, but, 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 we have um, um, one question from Rachel Pearson. And I'll bring this up on stage so people can see. 
Uh, Rachel Pearson asks, what would be one way to continue a culture of learning in large groups? Uh, additional detail, I admin a group on Facebook that's approaching 90,000 members. Well, first of all, if you are admitting a group of nine, 90,000 members, I want you up here on the stage and telling us what you're doing because Facebook is such a difficult environment um, because it, it really is a creative space, a, cre a great space for toxicity. It, um, so in, in the, the nature of how conversations flow, it is really a challenging environment. I, I think the second question is like, I need to understand what the purpose of the learning is because it, it, I can't answer that in the generic with, except with generic answers, which may be totally ridiculous. So maybe you can tell us a little bit more about the context. I would love to hear more. Um, and uh, Rachel, if you can, if your if your camera is on, we can beam you up on stage. Otherwise, just type in more in a, in a follow up question. And, and, and we'd, we'd love to hear that. Um, while uh, she is doing that, um, we have uh, a question from, uh, I'm gonna try and pronounce this correctly, Marcella Garces. Um, forgive me if I've mangled this. Uh, I, I'm working too many languages. Garces, what are some of the activities or strategies that work the best to engage with students online in synchronous web sessions? Okay, so Marcella, I'm curious about what age group you're talking about because I think there's some very different responses and I can, as I said to, to Brian before we started, I do not work in academia, okay? I'm, a, I'm an outsider, um, but I work in learning situations almost all the time, learning and doing situations. Um, for me, some, there's some of the basic stuff that we learned about flipped classrooms that we can rely upon. So, you know, really watching, putting con too much content into the synchronous session and really having people work with content. So if it is about divergent thinking, okay, so if the topic is X, how do we think about other ways to think about that? So I tend not to do open brainstorming. I tend to put people in small groups and create different ways of coming up with new ideas. And one of my favorite ways is, let, let's say you're trying to figure out how to do this experiment. I start with, what are all the ways you can cause this experiment to fail? So um, it comes from a Russian engineering process called TRIZ, which I can't remember the Russian words, but I could get it for you if you want it. Um, and you have them list all the things to guarantee success. And I tell them, I really want you to fail. And sometimes I'll put them in breakout rooms and then I'll break. One way is to have them record their list of failures in a Google slide. So I get each group has a slide. So there's a digital and a capture. There's a kinesthetic piece that's building in here. It says, you know, you're bringing in the whole self. And then sometimes we'll come back in plenary and we'll read each other's lists. And then I'll say, okay, now beg, borrow, and steal from other people's lists. Finish your list. Then the next step is they go back into their breakout room and they have to mark every one of those things that are present in their current approach to doing that experiment or thing or whatever it is. And then it's like, oh. So how could you fail in, in this test next week? How could you fail in this report that you need to write? How could you fail in this research approach you're taking? Um, and they have to mark everything they're already doing. And typically, you know, people come back between 30 and 90 or even 100%. They're doing things that cause them to fail. And this goes to, we are so used to doing things in, in a certain way and in a, company, in a customer way, we're in our track that we fail to even see we're in a, in, a, in a rut, right? So then the final question is, what is one thing you're gonna stop doing on that list? And what is your first step to stop doing that? So if you know, again, I'm making huge assumptions about age, group, and domain here, but, you know, maybe I am really crap at annotating my sources. Well, I'm <clears> going <throat> to go take this tutorial on um, how I annotate my sources better. Um, um, and, and so I'm creating that thing. Yeah, what, yes, Brian? Uh, Marcella uh, chimed in to say uh, university age. University age. So TRIZ works well across all those ages. Um, the other thing that I'm doing a lot um, and, and we did this at the University of Guadalajara in a project we did five years ago down there, um, is to use a pro process called what, so what, now what? And it's, you know, I'm sure you've heard of this before a million times. Again, I, I'm looking at it from the perspective of liberating structures, which is the group process approach that I'm deeply embedded in, and which, by the way, in a, again, the last four months, we've been able to move almost all those processes online, and the last few gnarly ones are being worked on right now. 
But I ask, you know, if there was some content that was delivered, I say, okay, now in the chat, what just happened in the last 10 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever it was. And you talked about this. You talked about that. And then I'm going, is that all you observed? What other data did you observe? Mm -hmm. uh, you talked all the time. Okay, good, good. What else did you do? Well, we didn't talk all the time. And you're building their ability to pay attention. Then the first time, usually everyone's crap at it, all ages, by the way. The second one is, so what? What do you make of that data? What is your interpretation of the data? What is the meaning? Why is it important? What conclusions do you draw from that data? And then they say, well, you know, you're a boring lecturer. <laughs> Maybe you're a fantastic lecturer. And, um, I really benefit from lectures. I don't benefit from lectures. And again, right now I'm, I'm doing meta questions. You, yours would be in the domain you're working on. And then so what? So what should be our next step together on this? And again, they can verbalize it if it's a small group. If it's a large group, you can do it in chat. And when we do it in chat, by the way, there's two ways to do it. One is just to have people type as they go. The other is to say, take a minute to think about this, okay? Type it in the chat, but don't hit enter till I give you a cue. And this keeps people from being influenced by what other people are going to say. So that idea that first we think alone, then we think together, be it in small groups or large groups, is a really important pattern that can get interrupted in digital spaces where the fast people will dominate over the people who need a little more time to think and process. Mm. And when they hit enter, then you say, now go back and read what your colleagues said, what your fellow students said. And you can do another layer of meaning making. But when I use what, so what now at the first time, I get pretty crappy results. And I kind of call attention to like, you missed, like, did you notice that there was a slide up? Did you notice this? Did you notice that? I kind of call them out on their crappy data. And I say, we're going to do this again when we do after tomorrow. So before I start, I say, remember, we're going to do what, so what, now what after this. So make sure you're paying attention. And the quality of response goes through the roof. Attention has been focused because we're giving ourselves a reason to pay attention. So I'm going to go meta for you for a second. Group interaction exists on a continuum of over-controlled and under-controlled. Over-controlled means... An example of over-controlled is a lecture that takes into account nothing that's going on with everyone else. So this goes to the question about cameras on, cameras off. If I were just sitting here looking at myself in the camera and just talking or referring to my slides, like you guys become invisible. I don't see you anymore, right? I have all the power. I'm in the front of the room because I have control of the camera. I may have control of the software, which allows you to do things or not do things. Um, under control is what we finally call the goat rodeo. You know, imagine baby goats playing in the yard, knocking things over, jumping on things. And so under control gives people no power, actually, or to get things done. And over control gives them no power to be present and be there. And what you're looking like is you want to find that space that's just controlled enough and not over controlled so that people have agency, but you've given them structure for that agency. And even as we go forward, people need some structure, but sometimes they need less. So usually you start like this and then you mirror it out. So that's kind of one heuristic. You want to find the place between over-controlled and under-controlled. The other heuristic um, plays into that, which is you want to have enough predictability that people feel confident to engage, but enough difference so that they don't go to sleep and just go on autopilot. Okay. So when somebody turns on their slides, I open my email box. Anybody else do that? Okay. All kinds of people. Yeah. Um, so if I use slides differently, like I say, okay, now I'm going to put up a slide and I want you to circle and mark up the things that are blah, blah, blah. All of a sudden I realize I can't turn on my email. I have to pay attention. And this comes out of the world of uh, improvisation mm -hmm. is that uh, we're mixing messages just enough to cause people not to fall into their habitual thinking. Um, another way to do this is to use high status language, like I can use big vocabulary words, but I can act a little bit goofy. Again, there's a cognitive dissonance going like, she's using big words, but she's acting like a clown. There's something going on here that causes me to pay attention differently. So we're always looking for these things. So, so these are kind of things at the pattern level, over-controlled, under-controlled, and the mixing of familiar and unfamiliar, which give us a different way to interrupt that... <sighs> you know, that happens because we're human beings. 
Okay, I'm going to well, stop for a moment and take a sip of tea. Well, thank you. That's a fantastic answer. Um, and thank you for uh, uh, for the question. If, if it's, um, Marcella, if I mispronounce your name, please forgive me. Um, that's a fantastic answer with so much playfulness and uh, um, so many ascents from the audience. Uh, we have a, a video question coming in from uh, Tom Hames, uh, who I'd like to uh, bring on the stage. Uh, Tom is a, uh, a dear friend, um, longtime uh, participant in the program, uh, and just an absolute uh, treasure. And uh, I'm just really glad that he's okay right now because he lives in the Houston area. Tom, yeah. welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> now, um, I wanted to uh, ask a question about a point you made earlier or, or, or uh, get your thoughts on. Um, I have noticed that as time has gone on that uh, institutions uh, have become more reactionary in their approaches to dealing with the crisis. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm always a big, I always like to think systemically about revolution versus evolution and those sorts of questions. Um, and, um, you know, in my own presentations and my own uh, working with faculty in limited capacity, uh, I have really emphasized taking things apart, breaking them down, mm -hmm. breaking them, like you say, right? Thinking about individual tasks that you're trying to do in your class and then building up from that as opposed to going, oh, well, I need to learn how to use the discussion tool. I'm like, well, why do you need to use the discussion tool, first of all, right? So take three steps back and say, hello. So. But that's uh, on the local level. I can work with faculty. It's not easy. They don't. They're not used to uh, thinking about things that are not in the context of tools. Mm -hmm. They, you know, the tools got to be the second or third step in this question. On the systemic level, though, I feel like I'm really swimming against the curve because they've come up with a solution. They're trying to bang everybody into the same shape hole, no matter what shape their teaching is, right? Um, our, our version of this is, uh, I, I think, a localized version of HyFlex called LearnFlex. Um, and I was actually cornered by a vice chancellor a couple weeks ago, and he was trying to get me to come up with a solution for teaching in that environment. I'm like, that's not the first question we need to ask here. Do we, you know, what do we need to teach, and does that environment actually work for that? You know, I can't imagine teaching the way I teach as a simulcast, I just can't. And I'm not, it's not because I'm not creative, it's just because those aren't the kind of conversations I have in class. It pretty much forces you into a, a lecture modality. And I'm seeing a lot of that though, in terms of uh, the technology being used to uh, produce conformity, uh, to, um, uh, and to sort of bang everybody into, because the institutions themselves are scared. They're worried about the least common denominator, right? and and uh, and how to shore up those things. And those of us that do things a little bit outside the norm are often caught up in that. So I was wondering what your your institutional uh, glasses in terms of uh, what you're seeing in the world and what you might do to sort of uh, counter that a little bit. So so first, I want to affirm what you said about that purpose before tools and purpose. So I kind of think about purpose. What activities do we need to do to support that purpose? And then what tools and processes do we support to make those activities happen? And if you go, I'm going to put the URL in here. This really is not new stuff. This is old stuff. But there's a bunch of worksheets that are and the, uh, the uh, digital habitats book is free. The book that Etienne Wenger Trainer and uh, John Smith and I wrote like three billion internet years ago. Um, and there's mm -hmm. worksheets. And sometimes I find if so, you give someone a worksheet that says, okay, why, what is it you need to achieve? By the time the student walks out of this course, what do they need to do? By the time they walk out of this session, what do they need to do? What activities support that? And then how do we make that happen? So giving them a way to not be seduced by the technology, because um, uh, it's often about how do we make the technology submit to our activity desires and purpose desires versus how does the technology drive? So I think there's a, a practice piece here that's super important. Mm -hmm. On the on the on the institutional one, I I I oscillate wildly between massive despair, anger, and hope. Uh, <laughs> and I and, and and I speak from my advocacy role as a uh, guardian of two small children in a public school system, 
that I believe has good intentions and can't seem to get anything right. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I have three high schoolers, and so I'm fighting on that uh, on that front too. In addition to my college students, yeah. And so my to, my my answer today, because I was in like deep grief about this two days ago, and then yesterday I have a, a neighbor who says, "I'm going to focus on the positive. I'm going to focus on the possibilities." And it was a good reminder that as a survival strategy, I have to do that. So I am now taking the guidance of my school district, which is still unresolved. They're gonna vote it on the 12th. They haven't talked to the union yet. My God, school starts in three weeks and they haven't talked to the union yet. <laughs> um, uh, is I, I'm gonna say, okay, I am gonna take your suggestions as the loosest possible guidelines and begin to discover what will work for my family, then begin to discover what works for other families who are interested in something different. And I'm not using the POD word because I'm actually not going that way. But I'm looking for models where kids and families have more agency in their learning, that the social connective tissue can rise above the, you must have 180,000 days, hours of learning to check the, you know, the superintendent of public instruction box. Um, and I'm going to do that through a series of iterative experiments. And my optimistic self is if I start showing evidence of usefulness, other people will want to begin to play a part in that. And then I may be able to influence. So, for example, one school board member is a parent in one of my grandchild's schools. So I think right, if I can demonstrate something to her, not ask permission, not ask for support, but to demonstrate results. I might be able to begin to influence change because I certainly can't at the top level. It is too dysfunctional. It is too reactionary. As you've said, it is too political. And now to, to add to it, and I think for very important reasons, the anti-racism agenda is coming to the forefront and equity is coming to the forefront. And that's a really difficult problem to solve. But right now it's a log jam for doing anything. So I think these side experiments are the ways that we can begin to imagine different possibilities. So one is we're piloting this summer what we call kids rule the school. So we have between three and five kids who get together on Monday. The kids pick the topic. The kids put out how they want to do this topic. Um, we, we put it on a Google Doc or a mural. I've given um, a Brian a PDF of one of the murals for the week. We did the Hope Diamond. Um, and they pose their questions on Monday. And then we get together and look at the answers on Thursday. So this afternoon, we have a, this part two on Cleopatra. And, um, it, you know, it, it's not that one, but we can talk about that one too. Um, it's another one I sent you. And, and, and what we're doing is then we'd say, okay, what engages the kids? Talking to each other? Yeah. Uh, a video that they can play with? Yeah. Um, the ability to set the agenda? Yeah. Even within some constraints that we're talking about history mysteries, right? The advice of a skilled teacher who's, who volunteered to be with us, who was just like manna from heaven. And we're going to debrief this. What worked? What didn't work? And then we're going to present it as a model or an option or something not to try. It could be a failure. Um, so I am really starting at the grassroots. And that's not a necessarily effective or useful strategy, but it's what I can do, right? The other is to reimagine um, the, the learning in a different way. So the slide that Brian put up, this is a, a redesigning of what used to be a six day face to face um, introduction to a, a fellowship program for, for women uh, agricultural research scientists in Africa. And it was, you know, it kind of looked like your typical business school leadership mentorship sort of entry point. We took all their learning objectives and we put them on a mural board like if we were face to face, it would have been post-its on the wall, right? And we thought what here requires sense making, which is where we prioritize synchronous, synchronous time. What is content understanding or grounding or follow up that becomes asynchronous, either self-paced or in small groups. What requires the relational piece that moves our learning forward? Because some of us are very much social learners, not all of us. And, and those became a coaching thread. And then we used um, we used the MIT uh, Theory U model because, well, there's lots of reasons it was chosen. 
which you know uh, starts with kind of downloading, observing, um, then retreating in silence and reflecting, and then acting into the future. And we reparsed out their content, and it no longer was in the same sequence it was before. So one of the really interesting things is to to um, question sequence when we move online, because sometimes I mentioned time is tricky. So sequence becomes a little more malleable, and sequence is about how much of is it an intellectual load? How much of is it a sense-making load? How much of is it a relational load? And so we start mixing those things up to have that difference we talked about a little bit earlier. You know, you're going to get a rhythm that has it, it, the different pieces alternate, and then there's something that pulls it through, that, which is typically reflective or peer interaction, you know, that kind of sense-making with a peer. And then we introduced a whole set of the orange circles, which of course you can't read this as client stuff, right? Um, is processes. And this again comes out of that liberating structures repertoire. And by the way, there are a group of educators who are doing some really cool things with liberating structures in the classroom. Arvind Singh at UT Austin would be one in your in your neighborhood. Um, Tom, right, Tom? Yeah. I can't remember. I have, yep. I have like zero name and face. Uh, yeah, uh, no, that's cool. Uh, UT is about 150 miles away, but. <laughs> right, right. Well, you know, it's like, um, well, it's and we're all online anyway. So it's it's uh, irrelevant anyway. But so that was that was kind of a long winded answer at the at the institutional level. I think the only way is to rise up. I mean, go back to Alexander Hamilton, rise up, rise up. Because, <laughs> and then I think it's students, their families who are paying their tuitions, it's teachers, um, and, and lovingly rise up because I, I think administrators are in a terrible position, but I think we cannot accept the status quo. We can't let panic drive bad decisions. And frankly, a lot of them look really bad from where I sit. Yeah, that's, and, and it's frustrating because you can see the good, the good path and it's just not, it's, 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 disconnected from the whole idea of teaching and learning the you know a lot of what people are doing and that conversation just isn't happening it's really patch you know forcing the it's it's forcing the the adjustment down onto the students and then the teachers and yeah. mm -hmm. and then making them adapt in a systemic way that is very difficult you know to achieve and especially without that larger support so I, I have a question back to you, back to everybody, is why aren't those discussions happening? And what is our role in convening or stimulating or rising up and occupying that conversation? Um, I, mean, I, I think, yeah, I think part of it is that, uh, I mean, first of all, we had panic. Then we had, oh, man, we have a plan. And now we're in, oh, man, we don't have a plan because it won't work. Back to panic. And when that happens, human beings don't necessarily react well. Uh, and we're seeing this all over society. This is not confined to higher ed or even K-12. Mm -hmm. But um, I think that's what's going on. I don't think anybody's stopping long enough to have those conversations. And anytime you try to slow down the mad train and say, hey, guys, uh, why don't we think about this before we go rushing madly off a cliff? Uh, we don't have time for that. We got 500 million things that we have to get done. We got to put up plexiglass shields. We got to put in video conferencing equipment. We got to wire this. We got to do that. And I'm like, we don't even know if we're going to use these rooms. What the heck, you know? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I don't know. It's 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 frustrating uh, because uh, you know I've I've developed a number of things from the ground up and nobody's listening to them. So, so with, the, with the task before the technology. We're building lots of technology. <laughs> no, say that. Well, well, we're we're listening to you, Tom, and I'm glad that you're here to to come in. Oh. Thank you. So I'm gonna, I, yeah. I just want to. I'm gonna put a link in the chat. There's um, one of the tools for diagnosing and then being able to talk about what's going on is it comes from the com uh, complexity science and it's called the EcoCycle. And what it allows us is to see those certainties and uncertainties. Another one is called critical uncertainties. And um, I don't know why my links keep on coming up all funky, sorry. Um, but I, I, I think what I've noticed is when we can parse out some of those issues visually, then people step back and they're more willing to have the conversation. If we just do them verbally, everybody's preparing their response. So I think this also goes to a teaching and learning thing is 
when we mix our modalities a little bit, we slow down that I've got to get ready to prepare for my smart response or the teacher's going to call on me and, I, and I'm no longer listening. And I think we have a lot of no longer listening going on at all levels of this system. So I keep on looking at what are things that can frame a shorter, quicker conversation, but that bring us a way to sense make it and a visual seems to be an important part of it. It really can be. Um, first, uh, Tom, thank you for the um, for the really brave big picture question, especially knowing your experience and Nancy. What a great answer, hitting just so many different pieces of this at once. Um, I'm, I'm, we have a whole stack of questions. I want to get a couple of them in before we completely run out of time. And this is from someone else whose name I'm going to try desperately to pronounce correctly, uh, Liza Debevich who asks, um, I'd like to know creative ways to make a meeting less WB-like, including tips on how to politely digitally interrupt someone, usually senior, who is talking without end. Are we talking World Bank? <laughs> <laughs> it's a hypothetical. It's a hypothetical. It's a hypothetical. Um, uh, the most effective strategy that I have is breaking people into small groups. And this pattern works face-to-face. -face, it works online. So instead of starting a meeting with, here's the agenda, I'm going to tell you what we're going to do, it's like, I'd like to turn to you, a turn to a partner and say, if this meeting were to be an absolute failure, what would, would, you, what would your role be in that failure? Uh-oh. Or what do you want out of the next 45 minutes? Yeah. What are you bringing to make sure that happens? Now yeah. turn to the person on the other side. So we do this in breakout rooms. And you can go first thinking about it alone. Yeah. then put them in pairs, then you can put them in fours, you can build it up. But you're interrupting immediately the habitual, either tune out or dominate. I mean, those are the two strong responses in a meeting, tune out or dominate. Um, this also starts changing the dynamic about who dominates a conversation, whether it's a uh, power structure, gender structure, racial structure. Um, when you put people in small groups, and you don't have to give them a lot of time. In fact, sometimes a time constraint annoys people initially, but then it helps them think, okay, we're really focusing on answering a particular question. And their idea though, is that the most important part of this design is what is the question you're inviting them to consider? And if you spend time on designing the right invitation, your chances of success go way up. If you just toss off some sort of like, why did you ask me that question? You're gonna go downhill really fast. So the skill of designing good invitations and I, I think this applies to meetings, it applies to classrooms. If there's one skill that I know that I constantly have to improve, that's the skill. And, and frankly, the only way I improve it is to share my questions with someone else and say, like, Nancy, that makes no sense. Here's a better idea. I can't do it by myself. So I design with other people, I'm much better. But many people, I, I have colleagues who can design brilliant questions. But this interrupts that power dynamic. Um, interruption is another thing. <laughs> that's a different thing. And I do a lot of kind of I, I just get goofy, but I'm often an external facilitator. So I have permission to act outside of the boundaries. Yes. Okay. So when you're within the power structure, I think there's some prep to be done. So when I'm coaching leaders who are dominating or interruptive or who talk too much, I talk too much um, I'll go into the meeting and say, okay, now, um, what's your plan in terms of how much you're going to participate and how you're going to participate, get them aware of their patterns. And then I say, may I have a code that I can share with you if you're not living up to what you just said. So I'm going in as a coach. I can send them a private note in the tool if that's possible. Or if they're not doing it, I'm going to call them on it because they've given me permission to call them on it. So I think there is this behind the scenes work that has to be done, particularly with leaders and people in power. That doesn't apply to a one time meeting. But these, if these are ongoing meetings, it's worth the investment. If it's a one time meeting, um, Say, oh, that's a great question. Let's take that to break out. And so you interrupt them with process. Perfect. No. Does it work? Yeah. <laughs> well, if it works, it works. This is crucial. Liza, thank you for that great question. And uh, I'm, I'm sure everybody, everybody around the, um, this mm -hmm. digital campfire nodded and thought, yes, we can think of people like that. We can think of examples like that. Uh, small groups are just a fantastic, fantastic tool. Um, we are uh, just a minute, three minutes before the end of the hour, uh, Nancy, which is crazy uh, how quickly this is rocketed through. 
Let me ask you a question because I, I don't think this has come up yet. This is a this is a forum about the future of education. I, I'm wondering if you could look forward a little bit. What are some of the changes and we should anticipate in this whole webinar video conference world? Um, maybe not in terms of technology, but in terms of practice. Um, well. This is a really hard question to answer uh, because I, I think, again, if we can't get clear on intentions of why we're doing this, we can't imagine a better future. So I think probably the most productive thing we can do is to spend more time about with purpose and intention rather than barreling along inventing. Mm. Invention is important, but I think we have this fetish about innovation that blows past purpose it blows past the intention of what outcome we want and if we blow past purpose we don't know how to set up indicators to give us signals whether we're getting the outcome we want or not and then we just blow on to the next thing mm. so if we could get a little more reflective and a little more intentional i actually think we could make progress much faster um you know to go back to tom's kind of that rocketing between action and panic um, a little slowdown in the middle may serve us enormously. And if we can build that muscle, and I think it is a muscle, it's a mm -hmm. muscle that is exhibited through practice, um, we could get further. Um, the other thing is, is I think we need to have more cross-disciplinary conversations about the purpose and the outcome so that we're designing with, not designing for. So this whole thing in my school district about the district hiring of consultants and not talking to the teachers. And God knows, I don't know what's true anymore. <laughs> what I read on Facebook, what I hear from a press release, I can't trust any of it. And that's a problem. But I think we have lots of insights that just don't get connected. So um, I don't know if you follow the work of Jerry Mikowski, but he's trying to think about what's the open global mind around any particular challenge that the world is facing. And clearly education is one of those areas where that cross-pollination could be incredibly empowering. Um, and, and that's a pretty meta answer. It's not an individual practice answer, but it does go back to like, what am I going to do? I'm going to keep experimenting, um, trying to lovingly provoke and engage rather than complain, um, which is challenging. <laughs> um, yeah. And uh, I think other people want to do that, but if they feel they're alone in that, they won't take the steps. So those of you who show up here today are people who take steps, right? So if you show up and publicly show your commitment towards experimentation, we can change the future quicker than if we're all just sitting there complaining or feeling isolated, alone, and unsupported. But when we're together, we can do more. And I know that sounds so soapy preachy, but I, I can't see any other way, Brian. And all of you have shown up here. And so, Nancy, you've lovingly engaged, you've lovingly provoked, you've lovingly reflected and invented. Thank you so much. Um, it's it's just been an absolute treat to host you. You've been terrific. What, um, <laughs> my cat's and you. the Zoom you cat shows up. I was waiting for the Zoom cat. I know, I know. He hasn't played a role for a bit. He's been sleeping. What's the, what's the best way for people to keep up with you? Is it on Twitter or is it from a blog or where? Um, well, uh, on my website, theoretically, I'm blogging. I've got like 222 drafts. I've been too busy to actually communicate outward beyond my community of practice. But the, the Liberating Structures of Community of Practice on Slack, and I can share that information, is probably the most direct way right now because that's what I'm focusing my attention on is this you know kind of iterating process forward. Um, I'm at Nancy White on Twitter, but I, I, I have really stopped doing a lot of tweeting, particularly during the Black Lives Matter um, re-emergence because I felt like uh, another white voice wasn't necessary. So I'm, I've really pulled way back on that. Uh, I owe my blog, my reflective writings, because that's where I, I, I practice and learn out loud with my network. But um, it just there's between kids and, and way more work than I can do. I've, I've been a slacker, so I apologize for that. Well, you've been doing a tremendous amount of work. Thank you, thank you again. And um, we're at the end of the hour, so I have to show everybody uh, what we're doing next, but I did want to thank you again. Um, but don't go away, friends, don't go away, because we have to talk about what's happening next. Not only am I being sat upon by a big cat, um, but we have topics coming up. So uh, for the, we have once a week, 
the forum continues to explore where higher education is headed. So we have in the weeks ahead, subjects including academic women of color, how to implement high flex teaching, work-life balance, redesigning liberal education, the dark matter of accrediting agencies and what they do. If you'd like to sign up for these or just learn more about them, go to tinyurl.com slash forumfall2020. If you'd like to keep talking about these issues, like how to interrupt people well, how to use small groups, how to invent and how to reflect without going too crazy with innovation, we have all these different places for you to do that, including Twitter. Use the hashtag FTTE. If you'd like to go back into the past and look at some of our previous forum sessions, we have a whole archive with almost 220 videos. Just go to tinyroll.com slash FTF archive. This recording should be up within a day. In the meantime, thank you all for your great questions, your great thoughts, your diligent work. We can't do this without you. You're amazing. Please stay safe, everyone, and we'll see you next time online. Take care. Bye-bye.